right. Hello, everybody. Welcome in. I see some familiar faces, familiar names. Glad you're here. We'll wait just maybe 30 seconds to a minute before we really jump in. Um, just to make sure that everybody gets a chance to join us, and gets to connect their internet to Zoom, all sorts of things like that. Thanks for taking the time out of your days to be here, no matter what time it is, wherever you might be. Uh, feel free to turn your camera on. We're always happy to see, uh, see your faces and to kind of give us a wave. Uh, we always appreciate that. It's nice to know who we're talking to. But no pressure, no pressure. <laughs> Glad you guys are here. I won't stall for too long. I usually make a, a, a requisite comment about the weather uh, because it's relatable to everybody. It's, a, a, well, it was sunny today. I think some clouds are rolling in this afternoon, but it was quite sunny uh, today in Portland, which is quite nice. Nice little treat for the springtime. Okay, it's 4.02. The mass of people loading in has, has slowed down. So maybe we'll get a few more people. I, I hope we do, but in any case, um, why don't I go ahead and slowly get started here. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome to our, our, I think this is actually our, our final faculty office hours session of the year. And today we're chatting with uh, faculty members from the art and art history departments. Or I suppose it's just one big department in, in which we'll hear about. But in any case, uh, my name is Duncan. I'm one of the admission counselors here at Reed. I'm just gonna moderate today and sort of ask some questions. And um, the way this is gonna work is we'll turn it over to the uh, faculty in just a moment to hear about the departments and the programs. And then we will turn it back over to you all to ask for questions. Um, and during that phase, we'll ask you to stick to the chat um, and the chat is, of course, the bottom center of your screen. There's a chat button, and you can type in some uh, some questions there. It's the best way for us to keep things organized. Of course, it you know makes a list, and we can. Um, I might synthesize some questions together. I might answer some specific ones in the chat if there are things that I can knock out. But in any case, got one more person joining us now, and um, why don't I? Turn it over to to our faculty members. Chris, you I think you unmuted first. Why don't you introduce yourself first? Hey everyone, I'm Chris Cohen. Uh, I teach in the art history side of the art department, um, and I teach classes and write about modern and contemporary art, so 19th, 20th, 21st century, but really more focused on the, the contemporary. Um, but also, I study and write about. Um, histories and cultures of media and technology. Um, and uh, my classes and my usually have, are sort of located somewhere between sort of art economies, which are, you know, in our lives, that's been mostly capitalism um, and, and various kind of identity formations, particularly race and gender. Um, my classes usually dwell in that area somewhere. Right on, and you're up, Aki. Oh, hello. Um, I'm Aki Niyoshi. Um, I teach in the studio art side. Um, I teach photography, uh, digital media, uh, internet, or making art on the internet. Um, so I, in the studio art, I think I represent the arts that uh, use technology. Um, well, I guess uh, the other, colleagues teach technology as well, but technology is the main vehicle for making art. Um, and so Chris will explain probably the composition of the art history side, but um, the colleagues that we have in studio art. So um, I'm one of the three full-time faculty. There's another person that's doing 2D, so mm, painting and drawing. And there's another person 3D and book making or book arts. And so those are the, um, the regularly staffed uh, faculty. And, and we have several visitors uh, doing social practice. Um, what else? Uh, bookmaking, graphic novel. So, um, so that's the kind of things that we offer in the studio art side. 
And then there's um, on the art history side, and I'll explain why we keep saying side in a second. Um, and there's, there's three other full-time art historians on staff. There's uh, Dana Katz, who does Renaissance art and architecture. Um, there is uh, Michelle Wong, who does ancient China. Um, and there's a brand new person who we just hired, who'll be starting next year, named Shivani Sood, who does the uh, painting of uh, 18th and 19th century South Asia, but also was interested in the early history of photography and the early history of film also in South Asia. Um, and then we have a visitor this year and next year named Jenny Sakai, who does um, a little later Renaissance than Dana Katz and specifically sort of Renaissance Europe in its relationships with various um, of uh, uh, sort of it's thought about in terms of the global trade and specifically kind of colonial relationships with other places around the world. So that's the staff and we keep saying side. So the art department studio and art history is one department here. Um, that means that all the faculty we just mentioned are in the same department. It also means that for the when you major in art, um, whether people who do studio or who are heading for studio and people who are heading for art history basically take the same composition of classes. If you and, and you don't really have to choose between studio art history until your third year, end of your third year. Um, and then the in the end, people who do studio take two more studio and two fewer art history, and then vice versa for art history. So it's really minimally different. So the nice thing about that is for people who are going to focus on studio, you get a lot more history than I think you tend to in an, in an arts program. And then for people who are on the art history path, you get a infinitely more studio than you do in most art history programs. There's usually not that access to studio. I didn't have any in my own training. So I think that, we, and we all really like having studio and art history, art history, art historians in our classes that makes the conversations much livelier and richer. It's an unusual configuration if I, as far as I'm yeah. told. So yeah. And I think that's one of the interesting and things about our department is that we do both. Yeah. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's still compared to, you know, some larger schools, a small in terms of just who, what we can cover in our history and what we can cover in studio, a relatively small department. Um, so there's lots of places where you can expand your interest. So if you had a, an interest in a particular kind of medium for studio practice that you didn't hear Aki mention, um, there's a bunch of places where you can explore those other mediums. It doesn't, if someone doesn't specifically teach it, it doesn't mean you can't learn it here. So classroom projects are one place where you can start to explore other media. Um, but but the, the, the most concentrated place we've been to that is the senior thesis. So a lot of times people use their senior thesis, the, 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 the major project they do in their last year to explore media that they maybe hadn't explored in classes. I think that actually might be a good next topic to talk about is the senior thesis. Do you each mind saying a, a few words about what the senior thesis project looks like in your respective sides of the department? Yeah, why don't you go walking? Okay, yeah. So. In the studio art side, it's a, well, every thesis is a year long project and in studio art, you make stuff, um, but you also write about it. So you produce a significant written component um, and you have this whole year to investigate. So it's not an assignment. You come up with the problem. So before you begin your thesis year, you come up with a proposal and you get feedback. So it could be anything, it, you know, you, it, it could be, like Chris said, things that were never offered in a class. So I have a student currently making a video game. We don't have classes on video games, but if you like to uh, spend a year exploring that, um, that's possible. Like think in general, like I don't, I don't think we ever said no to a proposal, <laughs> not that I remember. So. Yeah, and just to give you a sense of like what what is going like what kind of thesis can be possible, I, I just wrote down the four thesis students that I'm working with right now. Jin is actually writing a novel, an autobiographical novel, uh, with a video, and that's using uh, scientific concepts like entanglement, parallel universe. I forget the all the other scientific terms, but 
Jin is also a double major, so mm -hmm. Jin's taking classes in psychology and in sciences. So that mm -hmm. information is coming into the video that Jin is making. Uh, like uh, Caroline is making a video game that challenges the hero narratives. Usually there's sort of this, you know, you're, you're the hero and you're gonna rescue a princess, but Caroline is approaching it from, I, I, I think it's fair to say a much more feminist perspective um, and thinking about what agency means. Um, Ruby is doing a photo installation uh, project on asexuality. Let's see, Acacia is thinking about Judaism and gender politics, but it's also a very material photographic process using a process called cyanotype. So we have all sorts of thesis. Um, but anyway, so that's what yeah. I've been advising this year. Yeah, so it's a it's a year long process that happens in your final year. You do it in you do it under the advisement of one faculty member. Um, the typical way that happens is you meet with them once a week for an hour or so about your progress to that point and any questions that have come up and that that, that, that process can kind of guide um, where your research goes over the course of the year. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, it's really a place for people to think about kind of across the courses that they've taken their whole time at Reed and start to synthesize some things that maybe didn't happen in classes or in coursework that you wished had happened or push out into territories that you hadn't explored yet or, um, and, uh, it counts as a class. So you sort of like in your senior, most people's seniors see senior thesis in two other classes. So it's kind of a relatively light course load. So there's plenty of time for you to work on the thesis. Um, my, the art history thesis I'm advising this year is about, um, contemporary trans artist named Jess Fan and his, um, his sort of sculptural practice and trying to be really attentive to the way that sculptural practice um, thinks about the relationship between trans identity, racial formations, and, and science, and specifically sort of biomedical science that deals with things like testosterone, estrogen, and melanin. Um, so the, yeah, the, the pri and it's, you know, so in some ways it's a, it's a, a pretty radical project. In some ways it's a really traditional art history project because it sticks really closely to this one artist's sculptural practice and tries to give a very detailed, careful, historical and kind of formal account of what's going on in that sculpture. Um, so yeah, the projects range really widely in terms of medium, in terms of what kinds of art or art artists people study. Some people don't study art at all, but they study like a visual culture or material culture or the popular culture. I've advised because of my interest in media and technology, I've advised a lot of projects that are kind of more about popular culture on the internet than they are about any particular art or artists. Um, there's a thesis this year that I have worked on that I'm not advising that's about um, Google's headquarters, the architecture of Google's headquarters, the Googleplex. Um, and the kinds of things that informed that architecture and how that architecture has sort of played a role in the, the weird way that Google and companies like it have um, blurred the boundary between work and play. Awesome. I think that's a, a great overview. And I hope gives a good idea of what uh, what studying art at, like, at Reed is like. Um, I wanna turn it over to the students now. If you guys have questions, once again, um, please, put them in the chat and we'll start uh, compiling them to start answering them as well. Um, but while folks are typing out their first questions, I wanted to ask, and you touched on this a little bit already, but what makes studying art at Reed different than at another institution? Hmm. Well, one of the things that I'll start off with is by saying we're not an art school. So, I think there's many ways to study art. And one of the things that, one of the option is I think you go to an art school and study art, but I think the experience would be very different. Um, here, studying art means that while you study how to do things and study and read about art, simultaneously you're taking classes in the other areas like sciences and anthropology and all the different uh, disciplines. 
And also you have the classes, the classes are also, so I would say even in my most advanced classes, the 300 levels, um, I would probably have several, like four or five majors. And then the rest, like 10, would be students from other disciplines. So um, you have a conversation that is, I, I think, a very rich um, and, and, and also yeah. a very, you know, liberal arts, like, uh, conversation where students bring in different ideas from different disciplines. So I think that um, might be different. Uh, and for those of you who are interested in making art, that might be the decision you might have to make. Like, oh, do I want the art school model where you get to make art like all the time and it's about the focusing on that practice? Um, or here, so the, the drawback of a liberal arts college is that you, the class you just can't take all art classes you in a sense have to take other classes so that's the difference here chris do you have anything to add um no that's Maybe a good answer just... and i guess I, I mean my answer really just mirrors that answer but sort of reverse which is you know from the side of someone who's sort of more in the humanities in terms of what i teach and what i study um my courses and discussions in my courses are really informed by people who are deeply invested in, in sort of practice and 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 that usually has to do with you know some form of embodiment or some way that their body participates in those studio practices so i think from it's the same answer really just that there's a bit much richer experience um of the courses because they're because the discussions i can have in my courses are so informed by the studio side right on Perfect. Thank questions. you. Yeah. Um, and I think, yeah, so we've got a couple questions now. I think they are thinking about the studio classes at Reed. Um, so maybe Aki, you can speak to these questions. I think these yeah. first two can be combined a little bit. Um, yeah. And also the third one too, probably. Well, I haven't had the chance to read the third one yet, but um, so the studio yeah. art yeah. classes are organized. Um, I, <coughs> excuse me, as with I think other art schools or other colleges too, um, they're organized in some sense, historical mediums like painting and drawing. And we have 100 level classes that are, are entry points for a certain medium. But I think these days, medium, just medium, I think is, mm, it doesn't capture the full scope of practice. So there are other entry classes like, I don't know, I think, uh, thinking about the social, na not, mm, social nature of objects. Like it, it, it's kind of a cl class that thinks about objects and where they come from, but that's a little bit outside of the <laughs> medium. So I guess I would say that there are different entry points. And then, so we have the 100 level where it's designed for students who have never taken an art class, even in high school. So whether it's a medium specific class or, or idea oriented class, it's designed so that everybody could uh, join and do the assignments. And then there's the 200 level classes, which again, it could be an idea based class or a medium based class, but I'll take photography for example, because I teach photography where I expect certain skills already in those classes where, for example, in my photography class, like I, I expect that you already know how to do the darkroom processing, how to process film, how to do the digital imaging, Photoshop, those things, because I already did that in photo, uh, photography one. So there's a prerequisite. So a lot of the 200 level classes will have certain kind of prerequisites. And then you go to the 300 level where um, I think generally speaking, I think it it's more uh, the, the courses are more, mm, it, it involves more independent work. There's going to be, for example, in my classes, there'll be readings, there'll be conversations, and there'll be maybe small assignments. But the core or the anchor of it is what you bring to the class and maybe a semester long project or something like that. So there's a little bit more of an independent and flexibility there. So I, I'm trying, I, um, and to answer your question uh, about how interdisciplinary in terms of medium, we actually 
encourage that be, uh, by, uh, if you're an art major, so you're requi required to take uh, two 100 level classes from a different area. So you just can't stick to like, I don't know, photography. But the other realistic and a practical uh, answer is that we're a small school. So I don't teach like seven photography classes. I only have two photography classes. So eventually you'll have to take classes uh, from other medium anyway, but we encourage that by making it a requirement. I think that was a, a really thorough answer. Thank you, Aki. Um, and let's see, this next question that just popped up, are there certain classes you need to take or is it just a certain amount of the classes in each department? Um, maybe Chris, you can answer this one. Yeah, it's, it's more, a certain amount than it is certain classes on um, on the art history side there's one class that basically gives you access to every other class in the department it's called introduction to art history art 201 um and i'll say a, a little bit about what that class is like but um once you've taken that class you can take it basically any other art history class that's offered um the other requirements are more sort of area so we we want everyone to take at least one of what we call a non-Western art class. Um, that requirement's a little bit outdated now that we have half the department who focuses all of their research and teaching on non-Western. So probably we'll be getting rid of that requirement soon. But um, And then for art history majors, one 400 level, which is just a kind of an upper level class. It's a very, very small seminar on a very focused topic. And it requires you to have taken the, the introduction class plus two other courses in art history. Um, but there's really just the one named course that we require you to take in our history, the introduction to our history, everything else you get to choose from whatever there are. We just have a couple of guides. So one non-Western and then one, 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 one upper level. It's structured a little bit differently in studio. So you want to sketch that out real quick, Avi? Yeah, so we don't have a named class that you have to take. So there are many 100 course uh, level courses that you could take without prerequisites. And there are many 200 level classes that have some prerequisites and then 300 level. And so there's many ways to enter the studio art site. Um, we do encourage students to take the 300 level class uh, before they, uh, you guys take, uh, do the thesis, but Otherwise, yeah, there's no class that you have to take. Yeah. And it looks like we got a question now about the uh, film and media studies minor. Um, you guys mind laying that one out for us, telling us a little bit about that program? Yeah, no problem, that's easy. Um, yeah, the media studies minor is, it, you, you, you get a, a minor in film media studies with five units over the course of your four years. Um, one of those units is a is a choice between two required courses. There's an introduction to film theory course and there's an introduction to media studies course. You can choose either or of those, um, but you have to take one of them. And then beyond whichever one of those you choose, or you can do both four more units in film or media studies. There's There are usually about three to six, what is the number? Aki, do you know? Like I was gonna say three to three, three to five courses per semester in film media studies. Um, so you have a fair bit of choice, even though we're a fairly small program. Although in terms of oh yeah, go ahead. Although I guess technically, like all my classes count as yours. All yours do. So yeah. what that means is there's always going to be at least two or three per semester, at least on the studio art side, and then there's going to be probably three or four in the humanity-ish side. Aki's courses in are the only ones in film media studies that are practice-based. So those are the only ones where you would be working with a camera, potentially, um, video more than film, um, I would assume, but also photography, so photo camera. Um, the rest of the courses are either film history, sort of combined with film theory or and or media studies and the, the difference there is sometimes a little blurry but media studies would just study the history of 
various kinds of mediums of communication beyond just the filmic. So TV, now all sorts of forms of communication that are internet based. But you know, some media studies people study the history of writing and pens and paper as a medium. And you know, there's various kinds of photographic technologies that precede the photographic camera that could be studied as part of a history of media studies. So, so media studies just sort of studies the how theories and histories of how people have communicated in mediums, including film, but also beyond film. So every other course is really more of a history of theory course and Aki's courses are, are that plus practice-based. And film and media studies, are, is, they are not departments. They're taught by folks from lots of different departments altogether. Yeah. Sort of a team effort, so to speak. Yeah. So everyone who teaches in film and media studies has a home department and somewhere else. So for Aki and I, that's art. And a lot of the other people who teach in film and media studies are in the languages, actually. So German has a, a few people in French, has a few people in Russian, has a few people, those are just kind of the people who study film. Um, or who study media happen to come from those departments. Absolutely. So one question that I often ask to faculty members is how do students get involved with your departments outside of class? Uh, is there outside research that's going on? Jobs on campus? How do you guys see that happening for the art mm -hmm. department? I'll mention here, because I think it's a good place for it, the, the, um, there is a, an art gallery on campus called the Cooley Gallery, which puts about three exhibitions on per school year, um, usually one in one semester and two in the other semester. And I mention them, one, because they're great and because there is a lot of coursework that happens at Reed that overlaps or spends time in whatever exhibition is up at the time, which is great because you get to spend time with actual works in person. Um, the other reason I mentioned it is because a lot of our st the students in the art department have jobs and internships at the Cooley Gallery. And those take a couple different forms. The, those jobs and internships are sometimes on the education side. So they help, those people will help Greg McNaughton, who's the education outreach coordinator, uh, show basically in times when there wasn't a pandemic show the exhibitions we have to um uh portland public schools students so younger students um so kind of education outreach the other kinds of internships there are have to do with supporting the exhibitions that happen so more curatorial or so sort of the, the practice of just the, the practicalities of getting an exhibition of art mounted in a space um so that's one part of the life of the department that's sort of outside of classes, although it does intersect with classes, a lot of given that a lot of classes go to those exhibitions. Um, the other, another thing I'll mention, and then I'll, I'll let Aki talk a little bit about the studio side, but um, sometimes we, you know, each of the faculty members in art history conducts their own research and those, for the five of us who are here, that usually looks like, you know, essays and books. Um, and I often have students working with me over the summer to just, to just sort of help with that research. I've had people help me building reading lists of bibliographies for the, the stuff I want to work on. Um, I've also had people help me with tracking down images and image rights, which means sort of being in contact with the artist or with galleries to help get the rights to use certain images. Um, so that happens fairly frequently in the department as well. Yeah, I don't think I have. I was thinking the Cooley Gallery too. Um, yeah. Um, I'll we also answer, have a. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, no, I, I was going to change the subject. I was going to answer a different question. I'll just say then that we, a lot of our students want to have some experience working in galleries or museums over the summers. And um, there's not, there's nothing that's formalized but we all have different kinds of relationships with local galleries and sometimes with um with galleries and museums and other places so new york for instance so we often students are often able to find those relationships on their own but we facilitate those where we can and help people get 
positions, internships in galleries or museums or working for local artists and as studio assistants. So that, that happens fairly frequently too. Yeah. And speaking of internships, so there are several opportunities for art majors uh, or even if you're not an art major, for, but the, for internships, if you get an internship and if you need some kind of support, there's grants that you could apply to and you get $2,000 or $3,000, I forget. Uh, and those are reserved for art majors, but there's also creative grants that are not limited to art students, but uh, for example, the Locker, uh, what is it? The Locker Summer Scholarship where you get to do mm. a creative project uh, during the summer. So you could, anybody could apply um, with a creative project and you could spend the summer doing a creative uh, project and the grant will support you whether, I think it's, it might even include some kind of living expenses or something. I think it was in the order of $3,000 yeah. or something. So, um, so there are Mm, yeah, grants and funds available for you to do creative projects, even if you're not an art project, uh, art major. And in terms of the studios, so I'm trying to respond to Chris and Mickey's question. So the studios are open to students who are taking studio art classes. And I think, so let's see, not, we sort of changed the rules because of the pandemic. Um, you have access to it uh, from early morning to late night. It used to be 24 hours, but it became a little bit mm, difficult to do. So I think we currently have it as 6 a.m. to, I forget, 11 p.m. or maybe 1 a.m. But you do have access outside of the time of class. So you could come in and do things. So the great thing is that if you're taking classes like painting or sculpture, like, you know, you have things, you're making things. So you have places to store them or leave them out and you could come back and continue to work uh, outside of class. So I think that's the, yeah, the last two questions that I saw. Absolutely. Um, and so, Chris, I think you touched on this a little bit already, but I want to make sure we answer everybody's questions. Um, so how many of these film and media studies classes involve actual making of work and how many are more lecture slash theory based? I guess it's well, all of them are lecture theory based except Aki. <laughs> um, Aki's are the only ones that are practice based. So how as in terms of percentage, I mean, Aki's Aki offers five classes per year. So there's a guaranteed five classes per year, film and media studies, practice-based, but also history and theory. Um, and the rest, and I, I guess I could look this up once there's someone else, once Aki is asking the next question, I'll see how many there were this year, but the rest would all be history and theory. Um, so you know, two class to three others open. per semester um, would be history and theory. And then two or three per semester would be practice-based. So I'll put all on. That may change at some point in the future. Um, studio has sort of been needing to hire a fourth person for a long time, and that fourth person may offer classes that sort of are more practice based in terms of film and media. Um, but it's not happening in the next year. So, okay, thank you. Yep. And um, another question that I often like to ask, and maybe Aki, you can start answering this one, is how does the art department build community amongst its students? Hmm. I think, I mean, it's been quite difficult during the pandemic, but at least from the studio art side, I think the culmination is in the thesis process and the thesis exhibitions and the receptions. Um, the all the majors or the studio art majors they get their own space um in the studio art building so you would be spending a significant amount of time in the studio art building with your fellow thesis student so i think that's another area where i, I guess in some departments so you're you're kind of go, going from one building to another building but in the studio arts i think 
you'd be spending a lot of time in the building. So that is where I think the community building happens. Absolutely. Yeah, having a building is always a, a big help. <laughs> yeah. yeah, just a yeah. central place to go. Chris, do you have anything you, to add? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think um, the Cooley Gallery is another place. There's just, a, there, there's enough sort of energy around the exhibitions in terms of classes that visit there, but also students from our department who work there, that they're used, that the Cooley ends up kind of being a nice gathering place for our students crossing over art history and studio. Um, but other than that, I, I, yeah, I think that this, because even the art historians have to take a bunch of studio classes and because the studio building really ends up being kind of the center of gravity for all of that. And probably really the studios themselves where people are doing the work. The other thing I'll add to that, I mean, it's not necessarily uh, talking about the community, but we, um, I, I think a lot of our students go to this scriptorium. There's a, it's oh, a yeah. related effort, but um, we, we do have a tradition of calligraphy and Greg McNaughton at the Cooley Gallery um, hosts that and there's a I guess bi-weekly these days or maybe it's just weekly but there's a space in time where you get to just work on your calligraphy um it's sort of meditative and for and it's I I, I used to go there a while but it's kind of like a club um that you go every week just to yeah do your thing so I think that's another thing that's I think I looked up while we were talking, I looked up the film essays. I underestimated for the, the fall of next year, there are um, 11 courses that would count toward the film and media studies minor. Two of those courses are Aki, so two of those 11 are practice based courses. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. And it's actually, oh, hang on. I think it's similar in the spring of next year. Uh, a little, yeah, one. Eight, uh, eight courses in the spring that would count towards film media studies and two of those are practice-based hockey courses. Okay, thank you. So good selection. Yeah. Um, Mickey asks a good question. Are there, are there, there you go. Aki has, has the answer. Some photos are scattered in the art department page. I was just looking in, um, we in the admission office have some photo albums as well, but um, I would have to yeah. really dig around for that, which I can't do yeah, while I'm think, also talking. Yeah, I think it will be good to add those photos, but we have photos for like every thesis projects um, and some of them, like you could kind of, I think you could kind of get a sense of what the space is like from the photos that are come up. Um, you see a lot of the pictures of the gallery. So we do have a gallery in the studio art building. Um, and this is not for people from outside of college. It's for student work. So you get to uh, show your work if you're taking uh, classes that make things. And also thesis students will get to do a thesis show um, in the gallery or these days sometimes you um, students prefer to use their own studio uh, because it's has for a lot of the mm, media based students who do like projection or things like that you get to make the room dark but anyway so um right on another practical question how, how large are your classes usually studio art i think it's on, on the smaller side, I think 12, on the larger side, eight, no, maybe 18 or 20, no, I think 18 or 24, uh, probably because our studios are, there's a certain limited amount of space and equipment. And, I, and for some classes, um, safety concerns. So that's the maximum that we have. In, and then in Reed, Sort of generally, and, and certainly our history classes, their their classes are most classes. The vast majority of classes are capped at twenty four. Um, 
most classes don't actually have 24. Um, so my, my classes, it's a little, I mean, I do keep in mind that I do contemporary art and I do media and technology stuff and people tend to want to do that. So my classes tend to be kind of around 24, but I think the typical experience of like a 300 level class, which is to say just like a class with some prerequisite in a particular major is probably more like 15 ish or so, but, but capped at 24. So they, they really can't be bigger than 24 with the exception of a few big lecture courses. Yeah, I mean, this is not, yeah, like not the art uh, part, but I, I, my impression is that uh, a lot of classes on the STEM fields might be a little bit bigger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because not the, upper level the ones, lecture but, but and intro level ones are bigger. Yeah. yeah. So one other question that I often ask faculty, and hopefully you have answers, interesting answers to this as, as academic <laughs> advisors in general, is how do you see students in your departments adjusting to Reed's grading model? Hmm. Well, I think, so coming from a very different environment, uh, whether <laughs> different schools in the United States or different country uh, where students obsess about grades and <laughs> the goal is to get a grade here, it's in the educational experience is entirely different because grade is not as privileged. It's not your, or for most people, it's not the goal. That is my, yeah, that was one of the things that surprised me. Students are here to learn for the sake of learning. Um, and you may be wondering, well, okay, well, if I don't have grades, um, like what, what if I'm like, how do I know I'm not doing well or great? Um, so there, I think there is a certain amount of mechanism to catch that, that for, so for example, if you're not doing well, then the advisors or the instructor will start communicating with you. Um, but otherwise, it's not sent to you unless you ask. And that mechanism, yeah. I think, works pretty well, at least, or at least compared to where I've been, um, to change the motivation for why you're in the class. I, I probably had like one student in, in 15 years ask me, well, how, what do I need to do to get this grade? Like that kind of question never happens. It's more about well, I don't understand this. Could you help me understand this? Like that is the, it changes the focus of the interaction. Yeah. And that's what it's, I think that's really what the policy is designed to do. Um, I mean, I don't have a very disciplined department specific answer to this, but I think that um, it, it, it takes some students a little, like a, a semester or two, I think, to adjust to. And I think the, the hard thing is the the grade is like an immediate hit of I'm doing great I'm not doing great by my own standards whatever, um, and without that people can sometimes so there's we you get tons of feedback on everything you do here, um, and it's can for for people who are sort of new to the system of not seeing a letter grade on everything you turn in, it can sometimes be a little hard to know in those comments whether someone is saying you're doing great or you're really not doing great. Sometimes the comments are more like, here's what to think about, here's how to get better at this. Um, so sometimes people in the early sort of days of that come to me and say, but did you like what I wrote? You know, that kind of thing. And I, I've gotten better over time at, at building that into my comments, but that that's the only thing that really takes a little adjusting to is starting to set your own standards um, in a different, way um, than just, did I get a high grade or did I get a low grade? And you do that in collaboration with your faculty and, and, and everyone who gives you feedback on say a paper in, the, you know, in my classes. Um, when I get a paper, I'm, I'm, I'm always happy to talk to people. If I need to interpret my comments for you more, I'm always happy to do that as much as someone needs to sort of feel like, okay, I, 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 under, I kind of understand how my effort syncs up with his assessment of what I did. Um, it only takes, it usually just takes about a year and then it usually works pretty well for people after that. Um, it's yeah, not too jarring. It, but then, you know, the thing I say is like, 
you can always ask for your grade. We do record them. So there's no shame. You can always say, look, I just am having a hard time. I would just actually be really reassuring for me to know what I'm doing in the class and I'm always happy to go and everyone else is too, so. And there's a great follow-up question for Aki. How do you grade <laughs> art? Is it based on effort or is it how good their pieces are? It's almost a philosophical question that we I all know, struggle with. Uh, so maybe that's why I don't, I, I like I like this system, but I, I think grading art is somewhat of an impossible task. I try to be fair. That's the only sort of criteria I have. So everything matters. That is, if you do everything, if you come to class and the effort is there, there's a certain level of like, okay, I appreciate what you did. There's also the quality of work too. So I try to balance those out. Um, Probably in general, it's safe to say it's more about effort than quality. Yeah, I mean, if you do put the effort, yes, you will definitely like do decent. Yeah. Um, that is, yeah. Confidence. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, great. Well, it seems like we've got most people's questions answered at this juncture. I always like to end on a broader kind of positive question. Um, so to each of you, what is something that you really love about teaching at Reed? Um, for me, it's that the, the classes that I offer, even though at some level I've designed them and I've structured them can be so guided by students' interests. Um, and that takes a couple forms. I mean, one is that it can take the form of just where most of my classes, most of the time is given over to discussion of whatever it is we've looked at or read. Um, and often I have discussion leaders or people who prompt the discussion that day. So from the start, those discussions are usually driven by student interests and in whatever we looked at. But then also, you know, it, it with a smallish group of people in a class, I can make changes on the fly once I start to kind of get to know the interests of the particular group that's assembled that year for that class. So I often, I'm sure it's maddening to my students at some level, but I often make changes to the syllabus to adjust them in the direction of where I think student interests are. So the, so yeah, I, I, which, and then I guess the, the sort of secondary thing that makes that possible that I also really love is that the students tend to really bring a set of strong interests and curiosities about the material to class such that I can actually then let those guide the class. It doesn't, so I kind of set some boundaries with the syllabus and a topic and some readings and then the students can sort of steer where that class goes as much as they want to. I, I like that a lot. It's a lot less me and a lot more them, which I really value in a class. Yeah, I guess I, yeah, it, it's kind of echoing what Chris said, and maybe I'll say it from the, the sort of the conversation we just had. Um, once you're not motivated by a grade, I, I guess mm -hmm. you think about, okay, what is it? Why am I in this class? And I think a lot of times you're there because you're curious, you want to learn something. And that sense of wanting to learn, I think is just that that is the probably the uh the part that i enjoy the most um there's this moment in your life like you know once you get out of school you know you have to worry about all the other things and you have to have this you have to do that but there's this one moment four years in your life where you could actually learn for the sake of learning um that's i think special and there, i think i get we get a, a little bit more pure purer form of that at read Right on. Well said. Well, to tie a bow on it, I just wanted to say to everybody that if you have any more questions, please, please reach out to us. I'll put in the uh, in the chat a couple uh, admission office emails in case in case you want to get in touch with us here in the admission office. There's admission at read.edu, which is our um, 
our general admission address if you want to get in touch with us admission counselors. Then there's also current readies, write a readie at read.edu. Um, and those are the current students who work in the admission office, which do definitely include mm -hmm. at least one art major that I can think of. Um, Annika still works in the office, who's going to mm -hmm. graduate soon. So mm -hmm. email Annika while you can. Um, and, and Chris kindly provided his email as well. So if you guys have questions for him, feel free to fire away. Nice to see all you right. all. Thanks Good everybody for coming. Decisions Thanks you're for making. your time and have a great rest of your day.